Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beersmith Podcast number 33. Today, my guest is the one and only John Palmer. The sponsor for this week's episode is Beersmith. You can try Beersmith 2 Brewing Software, now available for Mac, PC, or Linux. It lets you design great beer recipes at home, take the guesswork out of your home brewing. Go to Beersmith.com and download your free copy today. And now, let's keep it short. Let's go into this week's interview. Today on the show, we have John Palmer, who's the author of How to Brew at HowToBrew.com. It's great to have you on the show again, John. John's one oh, of my uh, favorite much. guests. How are thank you doing? You. I'm doing well. Doing real well. So we're going to talk a little bit about high-gravity beers, or as I like to call, big beers today. Um, so, uh, you know, brewing big beer is a lot different than brewing a, a regular beer. Um, can you start by telling us what's a little bit different about high-gravity beers, John? Well, it's... It, the definition of high gravity itself is a little bit of a gray area. Um, uh, for so long, uh, brewers, you know, were brewing in the 1040 to 1050 range, 1055, you know, and and that was that was like normal gravity. And then they say, well, you know, I'm going to brew a big beer. I'm going to make you know something that's 1060. Well, and and to some extent, that uh, a 1060 kind of marks the beginning of a gray area, of that gray area where you're transitioning to um, higher gravities and um, higher stresses on the yeast, higher stresses on you know the fermentation and and um, different reactions that are going on in the boil that you've got to be aware of um, you know when you're planning your beer and planning your recipe. And so I'd say, you know, anywhere from 1060 to 1080 is this gray area. And definitely when you're above 1080, now you've got to um, really think about your fermentation factors and so on and, and boil factors. You know, all these things that, you know, combine to, you know, um, to realize the beer. Uh, those things are going to change. So... So the grain bill is uh, is really not just a matter of scaling up. A lot of times you have to tweak it quite a bit to uh, to really brew a high gravity beer. What are some of the considerations that come into play? You know, as you're formulating this, designing this new recipe. Yeah, well, you know, it depends. Are you you know when you make a high gravity beer, are you trying to make a high gravity version of a normal you know of a standard recipe that you have? Say, are you going to make an imperial pilsner or a strong amber ale? Um, you know, in those cases, what you're really doing is probably adding just more base malt to the recipe, um, you know, to kick the gravity of that beer from 1050 up to 1080 or so on. You're not really changing the specialty malts. Um, very often, if you scale all of the malts uh, up, you know, from uh, 1050 to 1080, you'll start seeing the... the um, especially malt character, uh, dominate more of the flavor of the beer. You won't have quite the same balance that you did, you know, in the, in the lower gravity version. Um, and I, in not that that's right or wrong. You just want to be aware of that difference. Um, so, you know, in general, when you're, when you're scaling a recipe for high gravity, um, 1050 to 1080, for instance, uh, you're probably, you're most likely just adding more base malt. Um, you, you can, you know, if you, you brew that and you say, okay, I do want a little bit more special malt character, then you can add that in. Now, what about, uh, something like a barley wine? You know, if you're brewing a barley wine, what, what, what do you recommend for a, for a base malt there? How do you go about formulating that kind of a recipe? Okay. Well, um, for a barley wine, um, well, it depends on the you know, the substyle to some extent, but uh, you know generally you're looking at uh, you know seventy percent, eighty percent of your fermentables coming from your base malt, um, and f for a for the barley one, I like I like the uh, crispness of uh, pale malt as opposed to lager malt. Um, I think you get a little bit more flavor, get a little uh, you know. A little more texture in that uh, high gravity than you would with just a uh, lager malt, um, if you know for like an American barley wine. Um, um, then I would add you know some some crystal, maybe some 
um, a touch of chocolate, um, you know, depending on what kinds of flavors you're looking for in this barley wine. Um, you know, uh, you could make it uh, like a Russian Imperial Stout, you know, adds add some roast. Um, but in any case, what you're doing is you're you're saying, I've got this high malt body uh, beer and I want to add some accent flavors and I also want to keep this drinkable. Um, and that's where you start looking at fermentation factors, you know, um, and, and in, when you're designing that recipe, you want to design the recipe so that it um, ferments down, it attenuates to a beer that is, you know, um, that's still drinkable. You want it something that is not super heavy, super cloying, um, and one that's able to be drank, you know, um, you know, enjoyably. Now, one uh, one challenge a lot of people run into is uh, mash efficiency. Your mash efficiency tends to drop off pretty significantly as you start brewing these bigger and bigger beers. Um, why does that happen, and and what can you do about it? Well, one of the the reasons is that um, you're con- you're you're not rinsing the sugars out of the grain bed as much. Um, you know, you're you're looking at a, a, a your first runnings um, of a high gravity mash. Are you know ten six ten seventy ten eighty, um, you can even apply, a, approach uh, one hundred um, with a with a very thick mash, you know one quart per pound kind of ratio, um, and so um, when you do that, uh, you you end up you end up leaving a lot of sugar behind, and so at the same you know at the same time you don't really want to sparge that too much because you do, if depending on how high a gravity you're trying to brew. Um, you want to preserve that concentration. Um, so there, that's where you're, you're coming into your efficiency loss. You know, it's real easy to brew a 1090 wort if you, you know, no sparge, if you, you know, you do the mash, create the first runnings, drain it. Now you've got a nice 1090 wort, um, you know, it, to make a barley wine with. But as soon as you sparge the remaining grain, and flush that into the brew pot as well. Now you've diluted that, so um, and that's that's where your loss in efficiency comes from. Um, that's why that's why a lot of people go into party grill brewing, right? You you actually right. try, where you, where you try and create two beers from from two separate runnings, if you will. You start with a high gravity and then you go to the low, right? Right. Yeah. That's that's that way you take advantage of the remaining fermentables and. Uh, you know, and get your efficiency back up, or you know, you make a big beer and you make a small beer from the second runnings, and th- and that's how you know British styles such as British Mild came about. Um, they were typically the you know second runnings. They were the small beer. Um, I remember in college I was uh, doing the play Othello in uh, in English class, and uh, at one point you know, Iago is talking about small beer. And I really didn't understand what that meant at the time, but now I know that you know you're referring to the second runnings, the you know the a small beer made from second runnings. Now uh, another consideration is actually the mash tun itself. For example, like a five gallon mash tun is not going to hold generally more than about thirteen pounds of grain. So so how do you sort of sort of roll that in? Yeah, um, that's where you know you're a, a nice cheap ten dollar cooler comes in handy because you can get you know a, a, f- a 40 quart or you know 50 quart cooler uh, pretty cheap at walmart or target and uh, that'll hold you know 20 pounds of grain uh, and help you you know b- help you make that high gravity word as a, as a first runnings and uh, get the kind of volume of high high gravity worth that you need um other things you can do is um, you can you can dough in and start recirculating, and that will pull the 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 kind of compact the grain a bit a bit, um, and then you can add some more grain. Um, but you better have some rice hulls in that mash, otherwise you're going to tend to stick it. Um, it you know, it's going to be the more the more grain you put in the mash tun, and the thicker that you make the wort that you're trying to pull from it. Uh, the more it's going to compact, and so yeah, rice hulls um, are definite uh, good idea uh, when you're mashing a very heavy, very thick grain bed like that. Um, I know a lot of malt- people tend to go uh, 
tend to go dive in and try and try and reduce the amount of water too. You know, go to go from yeah. say one and a half quarts per pound down to maybe a quart per pound. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, and, and that's that's one of the, that's about the only way you're going to get you know these really high runnings if you're trying to make a really big beer, uh, you know, big barley wine or a R- Russian imperial stout uh, is to do that. But at the same time, now you've you've really thickened. Um, the viscosity of the wort that you're trying to pull out. And unless you lauder really slowly, you're going to end up compacting and sticking that bed, and it, you're going to end up with a stuck sparge. So, um, again, rice hulls, um, plan on maybe, you know, more volume so that you have to do less sparging. You can just, you know, and you don't have to pull on it so much. And then really that's why I'd recommend getting a larger cooler uh, because then it gives you, it gives you larger floor area. You don't have to have as deep a grain bed um, and you can, you can pull that heavy word out more efficiently. Um, Of course, another way to address the whole problem is some used malt extract in the boil kettle. You know, you make a, make your main wort from your mash and then if you need, you know, uh, you know, ten more points, you know, OG points. Well, add add some dry malt extract to the uh, boil, and that will you know bring it up, and you won't have to complicate your mash methods. Yeah, that's probably a good idea because I know a lot of people tend to you know overestimate the efficiency they're going to get out of these big beers when yeah when in fact it tends to it tends to be quite a bit lower. Yeah. Um, Another important concept when you're designing a big beer is uh, is the malt to, to bitterness ratio. Um, yeah, how do you how, how does that really change as you as you scale the beer up? Well, um, different styles have uh, you know different ra- different balances, different ratios. Um, your your IPAs, your your double IPAs, um, those beer those kind of beers approach you know a kind of a a one to one um bitterness to OG uh ratio. Um in other words, in, you know, the the bitterness units or, you know, um seventy IBUs over divided by an OG of ten seventy, kind of a one to one thing. You so you've got you've got a near balance of uh, bitterness to OG. Um and, that, and, and you can preserve that as you increase. Right, that's quite a bit higher than a regular beer, though. I mean, a re- average right. beer is probably closer to a half, right? Yeah, I was looking. I was looking at how to brew this morning. Um, if you can hold this up, you can see here um, the table <laughs> yep. where um, what I page plotted is that on? just so you can show. Uh, OG versus bitterness for a lot of the BJCP styles, mm-hmm. and um, the the smaller the um, this line. Yep. No, that one. Okay, that's a half. Right. This one's two thirds, and this is one. So a lot of your, I'm pointing on the right side. Okay, a lot of the, your okay. IPAs are on this side. Right on the high end, obviously high yeah. bitterness. And then your more, you know, your pale ales, your uh, lagers, and a lot of other beers sure. are more often in the one half range. Mm-hmm. So you can, I'll, I'll you know, as you increase the gravity, you can add. More hops, more IBUs into your recipe, into your your hop schedule to kind of maintain that that ratio, maintain that kind of balance that you're looking for in the beer. And I'll I'll try and include a link to that in the show notes too for those of you that are uh, listening on audio. Okay, you can you can pick it up off the web page. Yeah, what page was that? That was page two twelve. Page two twelve. How to brew dot com. Um, sorry, well, actually, brew. not not in the. Uh, it's off the yeah, book. That particular yeah. chart is not on the website, so that's okay. on the in the hard copy. That's okay. So okay. <laughs> um, um, what are your preferences for hops when you go to a big beer? Uh, do you have strong preferences? I I really prefer the the more the, not necessarily low oil, but the um, hops like Magnum mm-hmm. or Millennium. Uh, for bettering Galena, um, I like I like a high alpha hop that doesn't have a lot of aromatic character to it, um, because you know you and especially in a in a big beer like this where you're if you're doing a barley wine or doing a, a double IPA, you know you want to put lots of bitterness up front 
Um, but and unless you're a real hophead and love Columbus or some of these other very, uh, Simcoe and these other really strongly flavored hops, um, depending on beer style, you may not want that that much flavor going into the beer. Um, so I prefer a more neutral, high alpha bittering hop. And then um, because I'm, you know, this is a it's a big beer. Um, I probably want to emphasize the malt character. Any other hop additions I do are going to be late edition hops. All right, just looking for some aromatics, looking for some accent. Um, because, you know, I, I don't want the hops and the malt character fighting with each other. Right. So, so I mean, you would you would push for probably doing maybe a single or. You know, a boil boil edition, but not a lot of finishing editions in most cases, right? Uh, boil edition, and then um, I'll I would do probably a uh, fifteen minute and a knockout. You know, something where I get um, fifty to seventy five percent of my IBUs um, in the bittering end, and then just save save other hops. You know, for some accent at the end. But it depends on the style, you know, that I'm brewing big. Right, obviously some, some, but but I mean, you go to a really big beer, they tend to have a slightly more malty uh, yeah. finish to yeah. them, I think. Yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, um, my barley wine, you know, I, I like uh, lots of finishing hops on that. You know, I'm a kind of American style barley wine. Um, Russian Imperial Stout, not so much. You know, I'm that there. It's it's just mostly a single edition for bittering. But it's interesting, I mean, we were talking just a minute ago about how you generally need a higher hop to a malt ratio as, a, as yeah. the beer gets bigger, but yet the beers, when they're finished, tend to have a little bit more of a malty character to them, even even though they've got that higher ratio, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of a dichotomy there, but if you're, if you're adding it as, uh, as boiling hops, right? Right. Um, you're you really just adding that, that to counteract all that extra malt you got in the, in the, in the beer, and then... Um, the uh, aromatics are not necessarily a feature of many of these beers. So. Right. Yeah, that depends on personal preference. Yeah. But one, one other aspect of, of brewing big is that you generate a lot more hot break in the kettle. And hot break is one of the principal uh, losses for alpha in the kettle. So um, the, the alpha acids, you know, they're, um, they're insoluble. That is, they're only slightly soluble. You know, milligrams per liter of solubility. I mean, literally, um, as opposed to you know other substances that will you know like the sugar that dissolves right in. You right. can put in pounds, you know, <laughs> per per gallon instead of milligrams. You know? Right. But so what? But that doesn't mean. I mean, it's not like it, it's not like that alpha stays on the hop the whole time. It you know as soon as you add it to the boil, that oil. You know, act like any other oil that you would add to the boil diffuses out, but it's floating on the top. It's sticking to the sides of the pot. It's sticking to your spoon, and it's sticking to you know other things in you know it's it's coating the proteins that gen are generated by the hot break, and so um, that's with so with a higher gravity beer, you have more hot break. You have more stuff to for the alpha to stick to, and not make it into the actual beer and that's why your losses your your hop utilization goes down with increasing gravity it's not it's not it's not a difference in solubility of the hop at that high sugar level um from the alpha acids point of view i mean it doesn't you know that difference of gravity from 1040 to 1080 is inconsequential um, in terms of its ability mill at milligrams per liter levels to dissolve sure. in. I and mean, it really doesn't see that change. What it does see, though, is a lot more uh, stuff to stick to and keep it out of solution. So it's really so. those proteins and the other uh, precipitates that are coming out that, yeah. are, that are dragging yeah. us down. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you mentioned at the beginning of the show that fermentation is also a big issue uh, for high gravity yeah. beers because because a lot of yeast really can't survive or, or don't do well, don't thrive in uh, in the high gravity environment. So I was wondering if you want to say a few words about uh, how you go about selecting a yeast for this kind of an environment. Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing is, all beer yeasts that we use can tolerate twelve percent alcohol. Um, there, that's that's not a problem. What 
the issue is is um, giving the yeast or giving the giving the fermentation enough yeast and enough yeast nutrient to perform at that level. So it's um, you know in terms of um, a particular yeast strain. Uh, yeah, there are some high alcohol strains, and you can find them from White Labs and so on. You know, or they're you know for big beers or you know and so on. But really, like I say, any any yeast strain, California ale, you know, just to take the most basic example, can easily ferment a twelve percent beer. Um, the thing is, you've got to build up enough yeast cells and enough um, wort nutrients that will allow them to reproduce and perform a healthy fermentation in that high gravity so, um, is it, to, this is to where, finish it out. So is this where some of the, some of the you know, real strong, having a real strong starter becomes important? Yes. Um, yeah. You, oxygenating. Got it, and if, you go to, if you go to How to Brew in sure. the yeast section, or you go to uh, Jamil's MrMulti.com site and look at his yeast calculator, you know, you want to you wanna make sure that you build up enough of a starter um, and it's probably a gallon starter or more, you know, enough, enough yeast slurry to get the, you know, 100 billion cells per, um, per, was it, per liter, five liters? Look it up. <laughs> um, to, you know, to really, to, to ferment, you know, so from, from the yeast point of view, from the fermentation's point of view, that it's a normal fermentation. You've got enough you know, yeast there to do the job with enough nutrients to do the job, and that. And when I talk about nutrients, I'm talking about free amino nitrogen. I'm talking about zinc, um, which can be deficient in some words. Um, so, you know, you need to make a starter, or you need to pitch, you know, an excessive number of tubes or pouches of of uh, yeast to make sure you get enough yeast and enough nutrients to that batch. I think it's important to point out too that the yeast requirements go up as you uh, as, as the gravity of the beer goes up. Yeah. So you actually need well, more yeast pitched uh, per point, if you will, as the gravity yeah. goes up. Yeah. It's it's all about you know it's all about um, resources and and you know, get, giving them the the tools to do the job. Um, so uh, it's. Uh, High gravity fermentation and low gravity fermentation are not fundamentally different. They're fundamentally the same. It's this it's this that we are so used to only pitching, you know, one pouch or a two quart starter to a fermentation and saying, Okay, that's good enough, it works. But when you get up these higher gravities, you know, you've got to realize how much your you know, your um if you don't increase your yeast count how, how much you're under pitching and that's where that's where all the historical problems and all the historical advice on high gravity brain comes from is that traditionally these things have been under pitched so barley wines they say you know um, age them for a year to get peak flavor um, you know or uh, let them sit or you know rack them off and and you know, after rack them off the yeast cake after a week or two, and let them continue to ferment in the carboy for another six months. I mean, it was, you know, because these were habitually underpitched. Now, it, with our better understanding of pitching rates, we we can we can brew an American barley wine and have that finish in two weeks, just like any other beer. Um, it's all about having the right fermentation conditions. You'll clean up the fermentation byproducts um, and that beer will you know flocculate and settle out just like any other you know style so let's say your fermentation gets stuck uh, with one of these big beers I mean do you, uh, do you dive in and pitch some champagne yeast I mean what's the solution then you pitch some more nutrients what's what would you recommend uh, I would the I would stick to I'm I'm old school in that I say stick to beer yeast. I don't I don't go for a, a wine yeast or champagne yeast. Um, um, but what you do need to do is you need to take that yeast that uh, whether it's a ale yeast or a lager yeast and make a starter with it. Get it actively fermenting. Get you know just 
add it to a quart of wort or two quarts and get that actively fermenting. So you get a croissant on top, then add that croissanting beer to the fermentation. Um, if you just add, if you just take the tube or the smack pack and shake it up and dump it in, it's really not going to, the, the yeast are still sluggish. They're still slightly hibernating. They're not going to have the same motivation and energy going in and to, to bring down the, uh, the attenuation of that beer as if they're at high croissant. You so really got to motivate that, those yeast, right? You got to give them the yeah. motivation that they need. Yeah, get them get them revved up <laughs> and them dump them in, and then and then yeah, then they will uh, usually uh, you know restart that fermentation and help bring that down. And you really you really don't have to aerate your um, your beer at that point. You you don't want to aerate the beer because if you aerate after fermentation, you're going to start creating off flavors. You're going to you know oxidize some alcohols and stuff. But so that's another reason to get that croissanting beer at high at you know, you know um, high high croissant, highly active. They don't need any more oxygen. They've got the oxygen. They've got the, you know, the um, the uh, membrane um, trellis and reserves and so on that they need to, you know, bud and and reproduce and, and ferment. So you can just add it right in. It should it should pick up right away. Um, lager yeast. I was going to mention if you're brewing an ale mm-hmm. and you know, you're a little bit, you know, if you suspect that the fermentability of the wort is is low, um, you know, in terms of your your mass schedule, maybe you had a high mash temperature. Um, so you you're thinking, you know, I bet this I bet this wort isn't very fermentable. It's probably got a lot of dextrins in it or um, it's you know, and that could be one reason and you know, you keep looking at your hydrometer reading, it's still at ten twenty five. And you want to get it down in the ten fifteen range for a ten eighty beer. Um, pitching a lager yeast can help that because lager yeast, as compared to ale yeasts, are better at fer- fermenting uh, maltotriose, which is the you know three chain three three glucose sugar as opposed to maltose. Um, ale yeast don't ferment maltotriose very much. Uh, they do a little bit, but not not very much. Uh, lager yeast strains have more of the uh, the enzyme to allow them to ferment maltotriose, and that can help bring your attenuation down. So, if you ferment, it, you would you would do that as sort of a last late thing to do if your if your your fermentation is stuck, or yeah, would you do that yeah. from the beginning? And and you have to watch the temperature, obviously, because lager, if you if you run it too high, it tends to produce a lot of off flavors. Yeah, yeah. So I, it's the kind of thing you do at the end. Kind of thing you do um, if you have to, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can mix your strains up front, too. That's, I mean, um, again, but you, you really don't want the, you don't want the lager yeast firming at higher temperatures because they will pretend to produce more esters and more, you know, off flavors at higher temperatures than an ale yeast would at the same temperature, all else being equal. Now, a lot of barley wines are aged for years, and you talked a little bit about that earlier, but... Um what considerations come into play when aging a beer? And, and, you know, you talked about how you, pitching rate helps reduce the aging time, but what are some other things you can do to try and reduce that aging time? Well, um, you got to, I guess you got to ask yourself, why are you aging the barley wine? Um, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, we are aging barley wines for a period of time for the, the remaining yeast to slowly reduce diacetyl and slowly reduce acetaldehyde or acetaldehyde. I don't remember to pronounce that right. Um, and other off flavors. I mean, you know, th- you know, the, typically these underpitched high gravity fermentations, you know, turned out a rough beer. It was a very green tasting beer. And so you essentially let that beer sit and let the remaining yeast kind of condition that beer over a period of time to reduce some of those off flavors and improve the beer a bit. My point was that with a proper fermentation, with proper pitching rates, you don't get those off flavors. Um, so you get a better beer, you know, after two weeks than you would have gotten after four months, you know, under pitching. Um, but now in aging, especially a one that's, you've got a rich malt bill, um, some different, several different kinds of specialty malts in there. 
um, you can allow aging and you know micro oxygen uh, to create some interesting flavors, um, some interesting melanoidin flavors, um, you know Maillard reactions, um, you know micro oxidation effects. Uh, can create some interesting, you know, uh, esters and other flavors that that you wouldn't get, you know, um, right off, you know, right out of fermentation. So that's one reason to age a larger beer, a big beer like this, a more complex beer, is to see what kind of interesting flavors develop. Um, and that's typically your old ale styles, your Russian imperial stout styles, for an extra stout. Um, what else? Hops don't tend to age well, so yeah. that's why you know Pliny, um, Pliny the Elder. They say, you know, don't age it. You know, just drink it. You know, as soon as you as soon as you get the bottle, you know, consume it soon because um, the hops, hop aromas and flavors don't age well. They they typically just tend to disappear. Um, so you be and as as alpha acid and isomerized alpha acids uh, degrade and become non bitter and disappear, you will have your beta acids, depending on your hop varieties, oxidizing and becoming bitter. So you'll see um, as you as you age a highly hopped beer, you'll see the the bitterness kind of change, you know, aroma and you know fresh bitter hop IPA kind of flavors disappearing and becoming a rounder um, not necessarily, well, maybe smoother, but you know, just a different kind of bitterness as the as the beta acids come into play. But you won't have the aromas, you won't have the the fresh hop character that you used to with an IPA. Now, for those of us who are impatient, have you got any advice for uh, you know adding things or or trying to help clarify the beer, uh, accelerate the aging process a little bit? Ah, uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, well, clarifiers. finings are always helpful. Um, cold conditioning, uh, finings to help drop out um, some tannins, uh, tannin protein complexes, you know, haze. Um, years ago, I made a, uh, a brown malt porter that was um, really harsh, uh, you know, right after fermentation. It was very dry, very tannic. And um, so I just left it alone in the in the in the fridge for you know kegged for i don't know four months or so and uh and then i tried it and uh it had the all those tannins had you know complexed and dropped out and settled and left behind a very smooth very nice beer a uh, very nice character um and so the the effect of aging in that case was the oxygen you know encouraged pr- polymerization of the protein tannin complexes gave them enough mass where there was ha- that haze or what, what essentially was haze and tannin was able to settle out you know and improve the beer substantially um, so finings such as uh, oh polyclar um, mm-hmm. isinglass gelatin can all help you know ex- accelerate the aging or the conditioning of the beer if you know if you've got uh, haze or yeast, you know suspended yeast issues, um, filtering is a way to uh, rapidly um, speed the um, the I guess what are they call it that I guess the condition of the beer where you in, instead of waiting you know waiting with time for the hazes and so on to drop out, yeah. you filter them out. Right. Um, you can make a green beer, you know, ready to drink that way. Um, okay. That's about all that comes to mind at the moment. No, that's good. Um, what are a few of your favorite high gravity beers that uh, that you like to brew? I I, l- I really like double IPAs. Um, and when I make a double IPA, um, I'll add you know simple sugar to it. Um, I'll do. I've I've done corn. Um, you know, kind of a, a cap. Double IPA, um, you know, with uh, corn grits or flake corn um, to re- reduce the body, you know, of, the, of these, you know, big beers and make them, you know, get the get the finishing gravity down into the near ten ten um, region, and uh, it makes it a lot more more drinkable, even though it is a high alcohol and highly bitter beer. Um, the Russian Imperial Stout I like a lot. Um, I like brew, 
I like brewing uh, black IPAs or whatever they're calling these things these days. Um, so you know, I'll add I'll add you know roast and and you know brew a ten seventy um, black IPA, and uh, so those are some of my favorite styles. Now, John, I understand you're working on a new book. Uh, we were talking a little bit about it before the show. It's about water. So I was wondering if you could just say a few words about the new book that you're you're authoring right now. Sure, the Brewers Publications, you know, the the uh, publishing arm of uh, of the American Homebrewers Association and the Brewers Association, um, has started uh, a four series a group of books uh, that came out. The first one to come out was Yeast that Jamil and uh, Chris White wrote, and. Um, now I'm working on the water book with uh, Colin Kaminsky, uh, brewer at Downtown Joe's in Napa, California, and uh, that's due to come out in the fall. We're still working on it, and uh, I'm been touring some of the you know the uh, uh, some of the larger breweries, some of the more well-known breweries around the country um, lately, trying to get a look at their state-of-the-art water treatment systems. Um, the book is going to cover water from kind of start to finish, you know, source water treatment, carbon filtration, um, deaeration, you know, what, what does a, what does a modern, you know, brewery do to their water before they brew with it? Um, and then do they add salts to it? Do they add, you know, do they add Burton salts? Do they, you know, they, um, add a little alkalinity if they're brewing a dark beer, that kind of thing. What recipe considerations do they make to the water? And then when the brewing day is over, how do they treat their wastewater? Um, wastewater treatment is a huge issue these days. Um, it's not so much for the, the small brewers, you know, the, the 10 barrel breweries that are, you know, doing 2,000 barrels a year. Generally, um, those, that level of waste they're able to dispose of, you know, right down the sewer. Um, usually the, the city water treatment plants can handle that with no problem. But when you get to bigger systems, you know, 50 barrel, 100 barrel, and, you know, two and 100,000 barrels a year. Now the city, you know, wants, uh, you, they insist that you treat that before you dump it. So um, breweries like Stone and New Belgium and Sierra Nevada, you know, they all have uh, wastewater treatment systems, you know, on site where they treat their bio waste, their spent yeast, their um, residual fermentables in their water, and, uh, and, you know, uh, digest that and and filter it out, and before they uh, dump wastewater to the street, to the sewer system. So we're trying to capture uh, all these different uses of water and treatments of water in one book, to so it'll serve both the home brewer and the professional brewer. And then Brewers Publications can do the same with malt and hops. Those books are coming out as well. So when uh, when is the book coming out? I know you're working on it now. Uh, I think it's scheduled for fall. Um, I'm supposed to have it done by July, and I'm I'm confident we'll get it then. So, um, yeah, fall it should be out. Well, I look forward to that. Yeah, I hope so. Is there uh, <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add, John? Oh gosh, um, kind of looking over my notes here. Uh, one consider consideration to make um, for a big beer fermentation is uh, be be advised that uh, with all of that, you know, gravity and protein and stuff in that beer, you're going to get a lot of blow off. So you know, plan on a larger fermenter, or uh, you know, plan on having a lot of you know blow off come out of your fermenter um, for that for that batch. Um, that could be uh, that could be a rude awakening, <laughs> if not. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate you being on the show. My pleasure. Anytime. It's always fun to come and speak with you and uh, you know talk to your audience. Yeah, I think John's been on uh, three or four times. Maybe it's as many as four times now. Last time was a holiday show, but yeah, actually, I haven't been back time. as an individual guest. I think since last year when we did the uh, we did a show on um, it was on stouts, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, uh, for right. uh, St. Patty's Day, we did one. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for, for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Anytime. So, again, that was John Palmer. He's the author of How to Brew at howtobrew.com, which I, I think is still the number one uh, brewing book on Amazon.com. So, uh, congratulations.
Thank you. Well, thank you for tuning into the Beersmith Podcast today. Really appreciate John Palmer doing that great interview. I hope you get a chance to go to Beersmith.com and download your trial version of Beersmith today if you're not already using it. And I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.